Good afternoon. Eric Anderson. I would like to offer some thoughts, some personal thoughts, on community self-identity, its importance for teamwork, sustainability, economic success, and cultural identity. Here at Squamish, um, the uh, community self-identity is about place. Socrates, two and a half thousand years ago, had some advice during a time of confusion and uncertainty. Know thyself. For Squamish and for community self-identity here, knowing, knowing ourselves is about place and setting, geography. Let's go back there. there we go. Squamish is a gateway community, like Liverpool, Singapore, New York, Vancouver. But Squamish is unique as a gateway community. It's a double gateway. Inbound, outbound, at the head of a fjord. Inbound, the experience economy. Outbound, the export economy. We live in a, a fjord valley below glaciers, a series of glaciers, and dormant volcanoes that are eroding. It's a dynamic place. We see the course of rivers changing, even in our lifetimes, quite substantially. We, we live in an ecologically diverse place. In fact, um, within the province of British Columbia, we live in the most diverse forestry administrative unit anywhere. We've got several major ecological zones, biogeoclimatic zones, more tree species than anywhere in the province. We're in a coast interior transition zone. We are also built over top of a delta, an estuary, an ecological meeting place. We know about floods, or we'd better. That should be part of our culture, and it is. We live in a windy place. There are two main winds, and the Squamish language has names for each of them. There is a southerly wind, which uh, Squamish language or Squamish elder Isaac Jacobs many years ago called the American wind. That was his term for it, or at least in translating to English. The other is the Squamish wind, the northerly wind. Captain Vancouver, when he came in June 1792, encountered a southerly storm. He was not impressed. And he wrote about it in his journal, Squamish, or the head of Howe Sound, a dreary, comfortless region. And for many years, in fact, decades after that, that notation was on every map of the west coast of North America. <laughs> However, the southerly wind is also what is favored by our wind sports enthusiasts. The northern wind, the southerly wind, both can bring good and bad. Squamish is an export gateway and has been for a long, long time. Archaeologists are finding Garibaldi obsidian for tool making all around the Pacific Northwest, as far as Oregon. The export gateway we, we see in the picture behind me is also evolving and developing. We can see construction, for example, on the left-hand side of the photo, on the easterly side. This gateway is unique on the west coast of Canada. There are only three ways through the coast mountains to the Pacific. There's the Skeena River, the Fraser River, and this network of valleys through the Chequemus and the Squamish. Squamish is a gateway to an interior landscape, an experience economy landscape that we think of today. But in fact, this idea of a playground is not new. It's been advertised for well over a century. This Recreational landscape is, of course, important to the metropolis nearby, and that's why it is important as a recreational landscape for the most part. It's accessible to so many. But we also have our own relationship to the metropolis. We're close to them for our trading and our recreational interests. And this is also not new. According to the Hudson's Bay Company's Fort Langley journals of the 1820s, when the Squamish people got in their canoes and made it to the big river, the Fraser, they got into all kinds of mischief. Alice Soesius Buckwas is standing near some rock art at the entrance to Northern Howe Sound. Or is it the, where you leave Northern Howe Sound? It's both. This rock art is very interesting because side by side we see two designs, an interior design wolf and a coastal art design human figure or mythological figure. This is an ancient trade and travel corridor between coast and interior. And we see also 
an example of the double-headed serpent just above the two figures. During the gold rush in 1858, the colonial government explored this coast interior route, and a year later, the British Royal Navy did the same and finally mapped it for the colonial government's purposes. Of course, they had native guides, and the route was not new. It's, of course, an ancient trade and travel corridor for, for trading. The Squamish people had ulican. The, coast, the interior Salish people had sockeye salmon, which doesn't exist in our river systems locally. So that ulican processed and harvested in the area of our Squamish Adventure Center tourist information area. Um, in fact, it was a major camping ground and gathering place during ulican harvest time. Traded with the Lilwat people and their, their excellent conditions on the banks of the Fraser for drying sockeye salmon. At the time that British Columbia entered Confederation in 1871, it was already seen that Squamish was a strategic place. Only three corridors to the Pacific. We better put a reserve on it before the settlers started to arrive. And so they did, with the provincial government. That reserve was later, uh, a few years later, by agreement of the Squamish chiefs, it was divided into the northern half of Squamish Island in the Squamish River Delta and the southern half, the reserve. The northern half would be an Indian reserve from 1876. The southern half ended up being the town of Squamish over time, and a port, as was predicted and planned for. That line that is so visible on the, our old earliest map of 1893 and an earliest aerial photo is in fact Pemberton Avenue. In 1887, the CPR arrived to the coast at Vancouver, and within a year, our first tourists and our first settlers arrived at Squamish. Our first tourist in the summer of 1888 was a noteworthy landscape painter. In fact, the president of the Royal Canadian Academy, no less. And he left behind some fabulous works of art. Our second tourist, a few weeks later, was the Duke and Duchess of Somerset on the way from England in search of sport in the far west. And the Duke, uh, Duchess of Somerset wrote about her experiences at Squamish Place a couple of years later. Within the early years of the 20th century, we had three tourist hotels before any export economy started to develop. We had a tourism economy. We had the Squamish Hotel, the Chequemus House, the Brackendale Hotel or Bracken Arms Hotel, and the Judd Farm was hosting mountaineering groups as early as 1905. The railway and steamship company partners were advertising, uh, the, promoting this tourism opportunity from the very beginning. Gateway to an empire, a, an empire, of course, of natural resources to exploit and export, but also an empire of natural splendor to attract tourists. In 1956, Squamish ended its isolation. Previously only accessible by boat, it had a train connection to the North Shore. But that's not what we wanted. We wanted a road. Because a road would be able to bring tourists, and we could develop that tourist economy. This was the argument, the long-standing argument of the people of Squamish. We want a road. And in that argument and campaign, the Diamond Head Chalet was of central importance. The incredibly hard work on the part of the proprietors of the Diamond Head Chalet, built in the mid-40s, long, hard campaigning on their part and the local board of trade to bring about that Sea to Sky Highway, or Sea View Highway, as was known then. Our first tourist information center in 1958 for Squamish, the gateway to the fabulous alpine meadows of Garibaldi Park. And the first tourist brochure of this period, 1960. Our export economy began with a cattle trail, bringing cattle from the interior ranches down to the coast where it was needed in the metropolitan or growing towns of the coast and the logging camps and industries. Down below, we see a railway. Well, this is the second phase of development, and it was related to the Panama Canal development and construction, anticipating that great export opportunity that would arrive with that Panama Canal. So a group of Vancouver investors and uh, strategists found a pass or an easy grade through the Chequemus Canyon. And they kept it a secret to themselves. Meanwhile, they bought up all the land in downtown Squamish. But when they released that information, it went worldwide. It was of such significance. The Klondike was still happening. Newport is on the map. Now we see agriculture, timber, not tourism, 
Tourism is the icing, or so they saw it, and they did spell this out. It's the icing on the cake. It won't help us build the railway, but it certainly will be able to be used by the railway. Newport will be the funnel. Have you grasped this significant fact, this real estate advertisement has to say? And it goes on to point out the same observation, that there's only three ways to the coast, the Skeena, the Fraser, and through, through Newport. Uh, this real estate company is selling lots in Dentville. The dock, the first shipping dock of significance was built in 1914. And by now, the name has changed to Squamish and under the auspices of a new railway company, the Pacific Great Eastern. The pilings for that original harbor dock are still to be seen today beside the Squamish terminals. The products coming out of this area in the export gateway of Squamish have been logs from the beginning and still now and then logs are brought down by train. During the late 1930s, Squamish was the busiest export terminal for gold bullion in the world from about 1936 through about 1940. All of the gold mines in the Caribou, the Bridge River, all of that bullion came through Squamish. Cattle was an important export through Squamish. It was hard to get to sleep at night when the cattle trains were parked down beside your house downtown. In the 1940s, there was speculation about when are we going to get this railway further into the north, further to Prince George, and what will that mean for Squamish, this sleepy place? Squamish did not change over decades. At the end of this First World War through to the mid-50s, Squamish didn't grow very much, and neither did the export economy. But by the late 50s and early 60s, the export economy and Squamish are booming. And we see a wood fiber opening up, now affiliated with Squamish as far as where its employees lived. A sawmill is built and other enterprises as well. It's noteworthy that not all of our export shipments leave by deep sea vessel. In fact, most of the time, all of these years, our exports do not go by ocean vessel to far off places. They go down the coast or up the coast. It's an important fact in waterfront planning. Short sea or coastwise shipping and facilities for that. Our mill at, at the, the Weldwood or later Interfor Mill shipped most of its lumber by barge. Squamish is a world-class export hub for pulp, wood pulp from the interior of Western Canada. It's a very scenic exit for BC exports, was advertised back then, and we wanted to keep it a scenic export for BC exports, so we said no to coal in 1973. Later in the 1970s, we tried to say no to more hydro transmission lines. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful in this, and they did build a few more. We are the, in the middle of the busiest corridor in the world for export transportation of wood pellets, mostly to Europe, but increasingly to Asia. This is a pellet train coming through in the photo, the downtown Squamish. Of course, being in an export gateway has inconveniences, traffic jams, and all kinds of inconveniences. But the tourism gateway role also does have its inconveniences. In former times in Squamish Harbor, the export economy and the experience economy worked side by side using the same facilities. That's not true any longer, and perhaps it's too easy to forget how they have worked together and still do work together. In 1913, when the railway was being pushed up the Chequemus, the first people to jump on board for a free ride were members of the Natural History Society in Vancouver and the BC Mountaineering Club. They loved it. They were funding to get that ride up the canyon. Our road access to the back country is maintained or is not maintained largely by our export industries uh, companies, whether in mining, hydro, logging. They are the ones that pay for the roads, and we don't have an alternate system. The export economy also pays for our land use plans, sorting out land uses between tourism uses, recreation, and natural resource industries. It also pays the whole bill for protection of the forest landscape. If we look closely, we can see community amenities important to our experience economy are contributed by local companies and people in the resource industries. The Curling Club, the Golf Club, Alice Lake Provincial Park, entirely built by local logging companies and their families. We have many other examples. The, the uh, um, Flying Club, the boat launch at the harbor, it's a long list. These rental boats and 
uh, tour boats in the small boat harbor of Squamish are all paid for or financed by timber dollars, without exception. The Squamish Streamkeepers have been responsible for some important successes in House Sound, namely the bringing back of spawn, herring spawning on a large scale and growing. And this is an interesting story, or an aspect of it is, it is interesting, is that the Squamish Streamkeepers are mainly made up by ex-industry workers or current industry workers who have special skills. Not all of them, but mostly. That is who they are. And they're working under a large industry dock which provides protection from the elements and predators for those spawning uh, herring eggs. Our culture is really both, is it not? There's aspects of the export economy culture and the experience economy culture that are quite allied. At least they're both part of our local culture. And we share the same challenges of mountains, and we share the technologies to uh, address these mountain challenges. In 1948, the Skyhook was an experimental operation across the Squamish River, bringing timber from way up the slopes and across the river. That very same machine was adapted to transport skiers up to the Mount, Mount Hood Resort a few years later, the very same project. We have seen in the last decade and a half four major plant closures in our Squamish export economy. A chemical plant, a pulp mill, railway shops, and a large sawmill. This has brought confusion and uncertainty, perhaps some tension as well. However, it's important to point out that no two of these closures happened for the same reason. And in fact, none of them had anything to do with Squamish as a location. There are myriad factors, mostly big company factors or big government factors and policies along with it. And I'm not suggesting that we would bring these same plants back, but they did not close all for the same reason. They have each their own story. Newport was the funnel, or thought to be back then, and Squamish still is. Squamish is the funnel, the gateway for a vast area of Western Canada, especially by road if you, if you measure it out. We are closer than Prince Rupert or Vancouver by road to a vast area of Western Canada. And this will continue to be important for all of us. We are the caretakers of this double gateway. And this means that we, should, we, are, we have responsibilities for people outside of our region, as in the interior plateau. Those communities will be affected for decades as a result of this mountain pine beetle epidemic. Their strategies will involve tourism development, it would also involve developing of new products, new manufactured goods that they'd like to get out to the rest of the world. Both of these strategies may involve our double gateway, and we have that responsibility to think of their needs. We have a growing timber resource in this area. Perhaps not everyone is aware of this, although this photo I have here illustrates it. Our second growth forests are growing very well, and it is projected that in the long run, we have a growing, available, sustainable timber supply. This is the Mamquam Valley in this photo. In Switzerland, which is a, a place which has more stresses in, in, of an environmental nature than we have, I would suggest, and perhaps maybe a little bit more awareness of environmental issues for that reason, they are working very hard to advance the use of wood products wood as an environmentally friendly product. Why would we not ally ourselves with this same? This is a building in Zurich, built entirely in wood. How many? Seven, eight stories completed early this year. It's only one of many examples in the Alps and other parts of the world. A few years ago, we had a visioning exercise concerning new plans and ideas for our downtown waterfront. They did not come up with, or they did come up with many ideas and visions, but not yet a plan. There were resource experts brought from uh, the Lower Mainland, and I myself found that they were very helpful, had many insights to share. However, if we take a closer look at this illustration that I'm convinced one of the Vancouver people put together for us, it's missing something. In fact, it's missing the short sea or coastwise shipping facilities and functions entirely because most of our port activities have been erased in this diagram. I think it's an innocent mistake, but it's something that should give us a cause to remember that we, it's self-knowledge that's important. 
We can rely on the metropolis for many things and many expert knowledge folks and so on that can come up here. We also would like to rely on them as customers for our scenery. But self-knowledge, the importance of self, community self-knowledge, for me, this is an illustration. I find that self-knowledge, know thyself, is a challenge as a community, as an individual. And so we can look to art or old wisdom or folklore or legends maybe to help us. And I find Rick Harry, Hualak Tun, artist, uh, an artist I've known for a long time, his piece at Halshan Secondary School to be of great interest. We see the double-headed serpent. And Alice Tsawasius Bukwa says, as I mentioned, choice as an aspect of this. But we also have balance. We have a double gateway. We have a, an eagle that is watching carefully. We have supports. We have a serpent that could bite back or bite into itself. I think that uh, I will leave you to reflect for yourselves on this double gateway identity of Squamish, whether and how important it is, and I thank you very much. Thank you.